Let's go ahead and get into our message this morning. And I got to tell you, I got to laugh. Uh, Kyle at this point and the whole worship team knows what this is all about at this point. Because you set out these messages and then you watch how the Sunday morning it unfolds. And what we're going to be talking about today in the book of Judges is what happens in Gideon part two. When Gideon cries out and he has his troops cry out that they're going to go to battle for the Lord and for Gideon. And the message today is we should only ever be doing anything just for the Lord. And when we try to do it on our own, this morning happens. Tech issue after tech issue, challenge after challenge. And you just get to a point where you just say, I, I, I can't do it. And God's like, I got it. Don't worry about it. We'll get there. We'll be able to do it. But don't try to do it on your own. And Gideon did. And this battle cry still makes me uncomfortable every single time. I read it. Picture this. If I were to get up in front of you guys and say, this 5-5, this, five, five, this Sunday of service thing, we're going to do this for the Lord and for me. How awkward that would be. You'd be like, what in the world? We're not doing anything for you. We're doing it for the Lord, right? And that's what they were going to battle for, for the Lord, not for Gideon. And if you need another reminder, remember Barak. We talked about Barak, right? Deborah enlists this guy, this military leader, to go out and to go to battle for the Lord. And she says, hey, just so you know, Brock, you're going to get no glory or credit for this. This isn't about you. This is about God. And this is only going to get done if we do it for God. And so when Barak goes out and he does this battle, he doesn't cry out for the Lord and for Barak. He just does it. In fact, he's so hesitant, he says to Deborah, you've got to come with me. Because he wants to make sure the Lord is with him. So contrast Barak and Gideon and what you're about to read as we go through six seven and eight this morning. But first, let's go ahead and look at Judges 6, verses 36 to 40, the due test. Then Gideon said to God, in order to see whether you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you've said, I'm going to lay a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece alone, and it's dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you've said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me. Let me speak one more time. Let me please make trial with the fleece just once more. Let it be dry only on the fleece, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. Do the do. So he gives God this crazy, really pushing it, do test. Not once, but twice. And you'll notice this test requires it goes overnight. So I think there's even an element of delay in this. Gideon's like, not only do I want to test you twice, God, I'm kind of holding back on what you've called me to do this battle. So I'm going to ask you to do this do thing. Okay? I got to tell you guys, I don't recommend this. I do not recommend you go to God and not just test him once test him twice. Because the Bible is pretty clear. Jesus says, don't test the Lord your God, right? Just don't do this. And Gideon does it twice. But what's amazing, a couple things. One, you'll notice God is very quiet here. God gets very quiet. And there's going to be an exception to that coming up. But God starts to get very quiet in the second part of this Gideon story. And I think part of the reason he's probably not particularly thrilled with this double do test, but notice he does it twice. Not once, twice. And Gideon knows he's pushing. He's like, God, don't get mad at me, but I'm going to ask you to do this do thing just differently. And God does it because he's that patient. And out of this message, there's a couple things I want you to notice, but I want you to notice God's patience, his long suffering. It is incredible how patient God can be. I'll say he's been remarkably patient with me. God called me into ministry four times. It took four times and he kept doing it. He got louder. He got clearer. He got more direct because he is patient and he is long suffering. He is good. And I'm also told that he wants us to be patient and long suffering as much as we push back on that. But that is our God. And he does that for Gideon here. And then the following happens as we go into chapter 7. Then Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the troops that were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them, below the ville of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The troops with you 
are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Israel would only take the credit away from me, saying, My own hand has delivered me. Now therefore, proclaim this in the hearing of the troops. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. Thus Gideon sifted them out. 22,000 returned, and 10,000 remained. So God does exactly what Gideon's asked him to do twice, affirms him, builds up his faith, and then says, so I think it's great that you got all your friends to come out, the 32,000, but that's too many. Now, remember, it's not too many for God, right? Like, God has no problem overseeing the billions of us on earth. The issue is it's too many for God to give the Midianites to Gideon. He says, the problem is that you're going to think you did this on your own, and you didn't. Now, we might not have 32,000 troops in our back pocket, but I think today what we can remember from this is that all we have may be too many for God. I think oftentimes we sit there and say, God, I'll do this once I do this and this and this and this, then I'm ready, then I'll do it. God's like, why? What if we could do it right now? Right? Now, this isn't saying that we're not supposed to give 100% to God. We are. We're told to do everything as if for the Lord, to give him everything that we have. But oftentimes, everything we have might be too many for God to get the glory and credit for doing it on his own. And he wants to make it very clear here, and I think he still wants to do this today, that when we do things, we get to say, I couldn't have done this on my own. But God did it through me. And once God downsizes Gideon and his crew, it becomes very apparent that Gideon couldn't have done this on his own. Only God could do this through him. And remember how God works. Remember how God operates, right? This is a God who deals in days. He created in seven days. Not weeks or months or years, days. He deals with individuals. The Bible is a long story of God talking with, working with, working through individual people. This is a God who grows the kingdom from a tiny, tiny seed, right? You even go out in the world and you see these gigantic trees and they started out as these tiny, tiny seeds. This is our God. It's a God who saved the world with one person. Not with an army. One. His son. All it took was one. This is how God operates. He takes something that's very little And then because he's in it, he does something very big. Now, note, though, how Gideon's got to be feeling. You've got to try to put yourself into Gideon's shoes as this is happening. He's got 32,000 people, and he loses two-thirds of them. So a full downsizing from 32,000 to 10,000 people. If I'm Gideon, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now because he knows he's going to go up against 135,000. So he knows that he was already outnumbered at 32,000. Once he's down to 10, he's outnumbered by over 13 to 1. So yeah, Gideon's got to feel a little bit uncomfortable, and he might have said something that I will confess to you I have said in my life. Where I go before God and I say, "I, I can't do this. I just, I can't do it. And I've said it more than once. And I will tell you guys, I've said it on my knees more than once. When I just had this feeling, like, God, I, just, I can't do this. I can't do this today. I can't do this thing you want me to do. I just can't do this. And I'll tell you, more than once when this has happened, I have heard or felt the following. God says, you, you don't have to do this. I, I don't think you can do this either. I'm going to do this through you. We're going to do this together. We can do this. And so it's okay to cry out to God, but he wants you to cry out to God. And say, God, I need you to do this in and through me. And I think that's what God is doing in Gideon as he moves forward. And the other thing you're noticing he's doing is he says, all right, so of these 32,000, I want you to send off the group of people that are afraid. All the fearful ones are actually described as trembling. I picture like 22,000 soldiers just literally like shaking because they see all these Midianites. And God's like, I don't need them. I don't need your fearful ones. I want your fearless. And God still wants that same troop. He wants us fearless, afraid of nothing but him, respecting him, afraid of absolutely nothing else. But what's fascinating to me is he sends home those 22,000 fearful troops, and he keeps Gideon. Think about it. Was Gideon fearless? 
we're going to see pretty clearly here that Gideon is still full of a lot of doubt. And yet God keeps Gideon. He said, I want you to stick with that 10 and Gideon. I still want you here, even though I can sense you're probably shaking too, because he's still working on Gideon. J.C. Exum describes Gideon, I think, really well. No character in the book receives more divine assurance than Gideon. And none displays more doubt. And what he's saying is in the book of Judges, there is this guy, Gideon, who gets so much grace and patience and interaction with God and yet he's the one that probably shows the most doubt in God. And God continues to work on him. And you'll see that as we keep going in verses 4 through 8. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the troops are still too many. Take them down to the water and I'll sift them out for you there. When I say this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. And when I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the troops down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, all those who lap the water with their tongues, as a dog laps, you shall put to one side. All those who kneel down to drink, putting their hands to their mouths, you shall put to the other side. The number of those that lapped was 300, but all the rest of the troops knelt down to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 that lapped, I'll deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go to their homes. So he took the jars of the troops from their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel back to their own tents, but retained the 300. The camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So here, really, try to put yourself in Gideon's shoes. God comes to him after downsizing from 32,000 to 10,000. He's outnumbered over 13 to 1, and God says, so you still have too many people. Now imagine... Gideon's gone down, he's taken him down to the river, and he's given him this lapping test, right? And there's 300 that go and lick the water like a dog, and there's 9,700 that don't. And you got 300 here, and you got 9,700 over here. If you're Gideon, and you're expecting God to tell you which group, aren't you thinking like 9,700, 9,700, 9,700, 9,700, right? Give me that downsizing of 300. God's like, no, I want you to take the lappers. I want you to go with the 300. Because what you have is too many, which means 10,000 was too many. That means 9,700 was too many. Because less is more with God. God has this remarkable way of taking what looks like very little to us and doing huge, huge things. And he does this test, this very strange test. And there's all these different theories on why this test was done and why God chose this group versus the other group. But you essentially have these guys that literally are licking the water like a dog would lick. And you have those others that cup their hands and they draw this water up to their mouths. And there's different theories on why God does this. Personally, I think one of the reasons why is when you look at this group that's just licking the water, it initially appears they're very uncivilized. Right? Who goes to a river and licks right out of the river? Dogs do. Or these 300, right? Now, I think it's remarkably efficient. I will add that, right? They don't cup the water up and lose a bunch of it in their hands. They're actually just going right for it. But I think God looks and says, there's a group of thirsty people. And they could care less what you think of them. They don't care. And there's just 300 of them. If I'm going to prove to you, Gideon, that you can't do this alone, that you're going to do this with me, I'm going to do it with 300, not 9,700. Because I need you to understand that you're only doing this because I am with you. So I want you to take the 300 uncivilized lappers, and we're going to get this done. Because in verse 7, he says, I will deliver you. And don't miss that verse 7. God says, I will deliver you. He doesn't look at Gideon and say, hey, Gideon, you got this. Gideon, you can do this. Don't worry. He says, I I'm going to do this. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to prove it because you only have 300 people that just lick water like a dog. I will deliver you. And I think he says the same message to you and I. He says, I I'm going to do this through you. You can't do it on your own. We, as people of God, we're the delivered. We're not the deliverers. We're not the fixers. We're not the saviors. We're the delivered, the ones who are fixed, the ones who are saved, the ones who are carried by the Lord, even today. And so think about that. Remember that. God is still delivering us and carrying us and saving us, even if it doesn't look like we have a whole lot to offer him. So let's keep reading verses 9 through 14. 
That same night, the Lord said to him, Get up, attack the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you fear to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Pirah, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hand shall be strengthened to attack the camp. Then he went down with his servant, Pirah, to the outposts of the armed men that were in the camp. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley as thick as locusts, and their camels were without number, countless as the sand on the seashore. When Gideon arrived, there was a man telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, I had a dream, and in it a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell. It turned upside down, and the tent collapsed. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand. God has given Midian and all the army which is as random as it sounds, right? So Gideon here has been downsized from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300, and he sent off allegedly all the fearful ones. It's like he looks inside of Gideon and says, hey, if you're still afraid, there's one more thing I'm going to do to prove to you that I can do this through you. Note how patient he is. His first instruction is go. Attack. Now. Today. But then he says, if you're still afraid, there's one more thing I can do to make you feel comfortable that I can do this through you. Don't miss the patience of God, you guys. Don't miss it. And I hope as you read through this, as you think through this, you look back at your own life, and you see how maybe God's been patient with you, and he's been long-suffering with you. And then as we do that, we have to remember we were created in that image. And so, yep. He is probably going to make us patient and long-suffering as well. But then he says, what I want you to do is I want you to go somewhere and I want you to listen. Because remember what Gideon is about to do. This test that God gives him, this encouragement he gives him, isn't a looking test. It's not a seeing test. He says, I want you to go into the camp. And when he goes into the camp, he literally sees soldiers and camels as far as the eye can see. They couldn't even count them. And so if you're Gideon, and you're trying to feel better about your life, and you go into the enemy camp and you see how outnumbered you are, you'd be even more freaked out, right? Because it's not a looking thing. God isn't saying to him, I want you to look and feel better about your life. I think he's almost saying, in other words, close these. Don't look. Don't look at the enemy soldiers. Don't look at how outnumbered you are. I want you to listen. And what he hears is very bizarre. But as you think about that, I want you to think maybe there's a way that God's calling us to do the same thing. Rather than look around and see as Gideon saw, right? All the people of the east lay along the valley as thick as locusts. Rather than look around and see these enemies that we have or see these challenges that we have or these obstacles that we have. God's like, don't look at that. I want you to listen. And I want you to hear an affirmation or a word that I have from you. Maybe it's out of the word of God. Maybe it's something that comes from someone else. Don't look. Because our vision is so limited. So I don't want you to look. I want you to listen. I want you to listen to me and for some message that I might have for you. And so I want you guys to think, where may God want you to look less and listen more? Not to focus too much on the things that we see, the way that we see, the obstacles and challenges that we see. Maybe just close those eyes and say, all right, God, how do you want to do this? How are you going to handle this? And (laughs) when you get the message of how he's going to handle it, note how intensely bizarre it can sometimes be. Okay? So we just read through what happened with the dream, but I want you to note the chances, like the really slim chances that all this happened the way that it happened for Gideon. Okay? First, God spoke to Gideon. That's a big deal. God's not speaking directly to many people on a super frequent basis. He can, but think about it. He speaks to him. God was quiet for a while. You're going to see God's going to get quiet again. But here he speaks again. It's just the fact that he spoke to Gideon. Seems pretty remote. And what he says is, I want you to go into this enemy camp, and I want you to hear something, which he does. Gideon actually makes it into enemy camp alive. 135,000. 
Somehow, Gideon sneaks behind all of them and hears what one guy has as a dream. I mean, just the fact that this enemy has this one particular dream that, for whatever reason, speaks to this situation is pretty random, right? This guy has this dream, and I don't know exactly what happens behind enemy lines, but I picture this one guy saying, hey, nudging his buddy, he's like, I had this like, really bizarre dream last night. And if you're the buddy, and you're hearing your buddy talking about like barley bread rolling into camp and turning the tent over, I'd be like, dude, you need to eat. You are hungry or something. Right? What are you talking about bread for? But the guy literally says, oh, that's clearly talking about Gideon, son of Joash. And God is with him, and we're going to lose. And in that moment of that one dream and that one conversation, Gideon, of course, is right there to hear this whole thing go down. The chances of this happening are so slim, and it is so ridiculously random, it's got to be God. Has to be God. And he has this dream, and it involves barley. Any of you guys ever eaten barley bread? Anyone in here? You've eaten barley bread. Did you like it? Did you? All right. So you like the barley bread. Very cool. So back then, I don't know if maybe, you, maybe it's better now. Um, but back then, uh, barley bread was not like everyone's favorite bread. It was unleavened, uh, roasted dough. It was usually eaten by the poorest of the poor. It wasn't the nicest stuff you would put out. And one of the things about it is it would break up into pieces very easily. I think that's symbolic of a couple things. One, I think it kind of shows the breaking up of the faith of Gideon. And two, you're going to see it very physically as Gideon and his troops come into the camp. They break up and they separate into three separate troops. But this dream was had. This guy interprets it perfectly. And it gives, of all things, Gideon total faith and confidence that God is now actually going to do this. And I don't want you to miss the irony of Gideon finally believing now. Think about this. Gideon's now had an encounter with an angel, a messenger, God. He's now tested God twice, and God has told him, I'm going to do this through you. That wasn't enough. What he needed was hearing the random dream interpretation about barley bread from an enemy soldier, and then Gideon's like, let's do this. Like, think about it. How ridiculous is this? That he hears from God, but that wasn't enough. He had to hear it from these guys, and then he's ready. And he does appear ready. Let's look what happens in the next few verses, 15 to 18. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Get up, for the Lord has given the army of Midian into your hand. After he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars, he said to them, look at me and do the same. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets around the whole camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Sorry, I just struggle when I read that. Um, so he's downsized, he's confident, but notice before he goes to battle, he does a very, very important thing. He worships first. Don't skip over that. He says, I worshiped. He literally stopped and paused, even though now he's ready to go into battle. The enemy's right there. He pauses and he worships. And then he did what God wanted him to do. And I don't know that we do this enough, that we start our day, we start our projects, we start our things before we worship and we say, all right, I'm going to pause and maybe we sing to God. Maybe it's reading his word. Maybe it's praying. We say, God, I first worship you. I thank you. And then we get to work. Then we do that thing that he's called us to do. I'm telling you guys, when I've started my day with worship, I have found that maybe my day might not go better, but I'm able to better handle that day because I started it by worshiping him, remembering who he is, and started it with an attitude of gratitude of what God has done in my life. And I think it's important that Gideon did this before calling out for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, I recognize that back then, this type of a statement was more common, right? To recognize it was for the Lord and to recognize the leader of the military charge. But I'm telling you, this and for Gideon part and you're going to see it as this story progresses, gets out of control. 
This only should have been done for the Lord. And the things that we do today, and I get we're not calling out that charge for the Lord and for me. We should only be doing it for the Lord, not for us in any way, shape, or form. Let's look at the next few verses, how this all goes down in 19 to 23. So Gideon and the hundred who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. So the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars, holding in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! Every man stood in his place all around the camp, and all the men in camp ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah, Toward Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Mehela, I can't even say that right, sorry, by Tabith, and the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after the Midianites. So they lead this charge, they say exactly what Gideon has called them to say, and it works. But I want you to notice two things about why it worked, okay? They have in their hands these torches, and they have those torches covered with those jars. And the reason for that is that they're sneaking up on the minions. They don't see them coming. They don't see those bright lights. And also, when they broke those jars, it would have made a loud sound. And then they blow those trumpets. It makes an even louder sound. And they seem like more than 300. They seem larger than who they are because they've got God with them. And the same thing applies today. You and I can do more with God than we can do on our own immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine if God is with us. So even though we don't have the jars to break and the trumpets, we truly can be larger than who we are if we've got God with us to do what he wants to do. But note how he does it. The other thing I want you to notice about this picture is not just that uh, they have these things in their hands. I want you to notice what's not in Gideon and his crew's hands. They're swords. And you'll notice in the background here, I know it's hard to see, you see a bunch of people fighting. And it's not Gideon and his crew. The Midianites take themselves out. The enemy helped to take itself out, because that's exactly what God set up, right? It's God who does this. But this is something I want you to notice that is so, so, so God. When God works his justice in the world, he often uses the enemy to take itself out. He's like, Gideon, you don't worry about taking out the 135,000. You just have 300 people. I'm going to take care of it, and I'm actually going to turn them against them. And he's done it over and over and over. So much so that in the Psalms, you actually see in Psalms, people start to pray it. God, may you turn the plans of the enemy against them. It's how God works. So don't focus on how you're going to take out the enemy ever. Pray, God, you make the enemy take himself or herself out. It's what he does. He's been doing it for centuries. I think he's going to keep doing it for centuries until he comes back. Now, the story continues, and I don't want you to miss how ridiculous Gideon gets. So Gideon has now been downsized from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300. He's got him feeling a little bit good about himself because this appears to work, right? But as part of this battle and after this battle, Gideon calls for backup, okay? And in other words, he's not confident that he can keep doing this with just the 300, so he actually asks for backup. I picture God just looking down at Gideon, just shaking his head. What do you need backup for? I got you down to 300, and we did just fine. But he does. He calls for backup, and he calls for the Ephraimites, and the Ephraimites come to the rescue, allegedly, and they join the fight, and they help take out two captains, two military leaders, and then the Ephraimites, in all of their pride, they actually get angry with Gideon, and they say, why didn't you enlist us earlier? We kind of like this fighting and things going well thing. Why didn't you get us involved earlier? And Gideon kind of kowtows to them. He boosts their egos and essentially says to them, oh, no, no, you got involved at just the right time. See, you helped us take out these two captains. We needed you right now. It's great that you came around just right now. Kind of calms them down, and they move forward. Now, of course, his army, his military, these 300 guys, they're tired, right? The Bible says that they're exhausted, 
and they're famished. Of course they are, after all they've gone through. And so what they did, they went to a couple different cities and they said, feed us. We're tired, we're hungry. And he goes separately to two different cities, to Sukkoth and to Penwell. He says, hey, we're hungry, there's only 300 of us. Can you feed us? Can we rest? And both of those cities said, once we see the hands of the enemy kings, we will feed you. In other words, once you kill these enemy kings, because they had these weird traditions back then, these ancient war traditions. One of them, they would actually remove someone's head and present the head, as creepy as that sounds. Or they would take their hands and they would remove the hands and they'd show the hands, see, see these are gone, I have their hands. And these two cities say, we want to see their hands. And we see their hands. We know you've defeated these enemy kings. Then we feed you. And Gideon says, I don't have those hands yet. But when, <laughs> but when, I, when I get them, I'm going to take you out too. Gideon is clearly getting pretty upset. So he does. He and the 300 go out. They beat 15,000 more. Take out two kings, those two kings that uh, Sukkoth and Penwell wanted. Brings back those hands wipes out both Sukkoth and Penwell. What's happening here is this becomes too much for Gideon. This is no longer for the Lord and for Gideon. This is for Gideon. Trent Butler puts it really well. No longer is Gideon fighting for a nation or a coalition of tribes. He's now on a personal crusade of vengeance. The narrator now proceeds without mentioning God. And if you read through this on your own, I'd encourage you to do that. You'll see God gets remarkably quiet here. Because Gideon's doing this for Gideon. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so I want to give you guys a chance before we take communion to think about what you might be doing in your life that's too much for you. It's not even for the Lord and for you. It is just for you. And what is it that we are trying to do on our own for our own benefit that maybe we need to say, God, I turn this over to you. Or maybe you're not sure. It's okay to say, God, I've been working on this thing. I've been trying to do this thing. Is this what you really want me to do? Or is there something else? Or do I just need to turn it over to you and let you do it the way you are going to do it and not try to do it the way I'm going to do it? Don't do it for Gideon. Don't do it for you. Don't do it for me. Do it for the Lord. And taking communion, I think, is a wonderful time to remind ourselves that God can take care of things all on his own. When we take communion, every week we remember that credit for who saved us belongs to one person. If you were look to the, the credits of communion. If you guys have watched a movie in the last several years, you notice like the credits get longer and longer and longer and longer. I mean, there's like thousands of people that are listed in the credits. And I just, sometimes I wonder like how movies ever get made with all of these people, right? The credits for communion are remarkably short. This one person is Jesus. And so as you take communion, as you process that, remember this is a God who is capable enough on his own to save us. He is capable enough to take out our enemies and to deliver us. Let's pray and then we'll take communion during the next few songs. God, we thank you for your patience. Your patience with us, your long-suffering with us, and yet you continue to use us. God, I thank you for these reminders that you can work through us, the Gideons of us, the doubters of us, and work on us and make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that if we've got things that we're trying to do on our own, for our own benefit, our own way, that we will stop, that we'll turn those things over to you and say, God, how do you want this to happen? You help make sure that my enemies take them out, that I don't have any part in doing that, and that I will reflect you better in the situation. And when we remember what that looks like to reflect you better, we remember what your son did for all of us. That you, Jesus, saved all of us on your own. And we give you full glory and credit and honor for doing that. And as we take communion, as we take the bread, we remember the body of Jesus Christ broken for us. As we take the cup of juice, remember the blood of Jesus Christ, you alone, poured out for us and for all, saving each of us. We thank you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we do this and pray. Amen.